So part two here. So what we're going to talk about in this hopefully short video is about uh, locating the earthquake. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, just a review, here's our different types of faults. And when you see this term, I apologize for this little graphic, but a thrust fault and a reverse fault are the, in this class, we're using those terms interchangeably, right? So here's our vertical motion up and down, up and down. So hanging wall goes down normal, hanging wall goes up reverse or thrust fault, and surface is sliding back and forth, that's a strike slip. But we already talked about this, where do we see the greatest stress? Well, the plate boundaries. And so when we plot earthquakes, they actually outline the plate boundaries fairly well. There's certainly some earthquakes that occur not along plate boundaries for a variety of reasons, different types of stresses, hot spots, and things like that. The majority of them are occurring at the boundaries because that's where the highest stress is. So, how do we find them? Well, look, when an earthquake occurs, it's not occurring at the surface, it's usually occurring somewhere at depth, and that can vary from very shallow to very deep. But just some terminology, where the actual rupture takes place, where the rocks initially start to fail, is called the focus, you can see that down here. What we report in the news is what's called the epicenter. They just draw a line straight up to the surface, wherever it intersects on the surface, they say, hey, this is, you know, Napa Valley, so the epicenter was in Napa Valley. That's not where the rupture occurred, but that is vertically up from where the rupture, rupture occurred. And they'll say, you know, it happened at, you know, 10 kilometers deep or something like that. That's the focus, right, where it actually ruptures. So here's some terms you should know just really quickly what they are. And so when we get this rupture, we get energy that's released. And there's lots of different types of energy that's released because the rocks are moving. They're moving in uh, vertical and horizontal and all these different directions. So they generate multiple types of waves. So these are the energy waves that we talk about. The first set we're going to mention and the ones we're going to focus more on are called body waves because these travel throughout the entire body of the Earth. So this is what we use to kind of figure out what's happening in the interior because there's some different properties of these waves. And real quickly, I'll just show you, we have the thing you want to remember about a P wave, at least for earthquake stuff, is that it's the fastest wave. Okay, so travels extremely fast, you know, four to seven kilometers a second, depending on the type of material it's moving through. It can go through solids and liquids, but it's the first wave that we see when we're trying to record an earthquake, because it's super fast, okay? When we have a, another wave, we can actually record called a S wave, or a secondary wave, or even a shear wave, if you like. It's a little slower, and it's because the way they transmit energy, right? So the P wave is compression, it's squishing the rocks, and so they crush and expand, and that's a very efficient way to transmit energy, so it's very fast. This is a shearing motion, so it's not as efficient, so it's a little slower. And of course, it can't go through liquids. It can only go through solids. There are some other waves that we'll talk about briefly as it relates to damage. But the body waves are what we're going to use for location. So real quick, we have the body waves I just introduced to you, P waves, S waves. Then we have surface waves, two types. We have what's called a love wave and a Raleigh wave, and it's just the different motions. One is a more horizontal ground motion, one is a vertical ground motion. The thing about surface waves is they're slower, so they're the last thing that we record, but they're because they're slow, they take longer to move through an area. They tend to cause more damage. And of course, they're located mostly near surface. They don't penetrate deep into the earth. So how do we locate these earthquakes? Right? Well, we need a seismograph, and so a seismograph is an instrument that's going to record motion or ground shaking. And there's a variety of different types and different orientations, so they measure the vertical and the horizontal components like that, and they can use those to figure out where these earthquakes have occurred. And all we're really doing is looking at how the waves that we understand are generated from earthquakes, P waves and S waves, how fast they're showing up at my instrument. So what I would look at, a seismogram is actually the, the paper or digital form that I would see. So of course, back in the day it was paper, now it's all digital. 
and computers are making all of these kind of evaluations. But what I'm trying to do is figure out how long it took time-wise between when the P wave first was recorded and then when the S wave was first recorded. So that would look something like this. Here's a P wave. Why is it the first thing that shows up on my recording and my seismogram? Because it's the fastest. It doesn't matter where it's at. But as these things race away from the focus, right, the first thing that should strike me or my, my seismogram is the P wave. And so sure enough, boom, it shows that the ground is shaking near me. Okay, Even though I might be far away, this can record some sensitive ground motion that might, maybe I barely feel, but the instrument could pick up. Then the next wave that shows up is the S wave. This is kind of the second slowest wave. So it makes sense that it's the next one to show up. And then the last one is the surface wave because it is the slowest, tends to shake the ground the most, and these are the waves that do the most damage, both the S and the surface waves. Okay. So what I'm looking for is the time difference between P and S wave arrivals. And so you can imagine, hopefully, when you think about it, I have thousands of seismographs all over the country, and there's an earthquake. Depending on where my seismograph is, it's going to have different lag times. If I'm really close to the earthquake, my P wave is going to show up, and then bam, right after that, my S wave. Because even though they have different speeds, the closer you are, the shorter the lag time is. If I live really far from the earthquake, the P wave will arrive, and it'll take a long time for the S wave to arrive. So shorter lag time, closer. Larger lag time, farther away. Now imagine if you're running a race, and you're going to run, a, let's say, the 100-yard the dash. And so, in 100 meters these days, I forget. But, okay, so two people, they're going to run. They're pretty close in speed, but one's obviously faster than the other. They run the race, and so... If they maintain the same speed throughout, somebody's going to get there first. The other one's going to come really soon after. But if they're going to run a mile and they're going to maintain the same speed, that distance between them is going to grow over time so that when they reach the finish line for that, there's going to be a larger difference between when they arrive at the finish line. So that's kind of the idea of what we're seeing with P and S waves. And we can use that because we have this kind of chart that we can generate that shows us how as the farther away, so this side here is distance from the focus or the epicenter. What it's showing you is as you go farther away, this distance, the time between these two grows. Right, so the, I'm at 400 kilometers, the lag time is this distance, right? Down here at 700, it's even bigger. 900, it's even bigger. When I'm really close, it's a tiny lag time. And so what we can do is we need at least three seismograms to be able to triangulate, which is all we're doing. And what we do is we have to have this chart, right? So you can't just look at the waves. You have to pull up your chart and say, okay, my seismogram says that the, the time difference between the arrivals of these two, and if this is minutes here, you might argue this is just under a minute. Maybe it's 45 seconds is the lag time. And so when when that's true, right, I would have this distance. I would be about 275 kilometers from the earthquake. If I'm out here in Indianapolis, my lag time is a lot bigger. Maybe it's almost a minute and a half. So in order to fit my minute and a half in here, I have to move my seismogram down and say, oh, it's about 475 kilometers away I am. And this one here might be, let's say, two minutes of lag time, which means it's way down here on my graph. And it shows me that I'm like 780 kilometers away. If I have all three of those, I can basically draw a circle around my seismograph station. And so because I know Memphis is 275 kilometers away, I can draw a circle with a radius of 275 kilometers. Because I don't know direction, I'm drawing a circle saying the earthquake has occurred anywhere along this circle because they're all 275 kilometers away from my seismogram. 
if I get another one, I can do the same thing with a different radius because it's different distance away. It will intersect my circle here. And so now I know it's either here or here. And if I have my third one, it should overlap one of those spots and tell me exactly where the epicenter of the earthquake is. Now, of course, back in the day, you did use a compass and draw circles. Today, computers are calculating that, you know, super fast. And they have hundreds of seismograms that they're kind of grabbing. And then data is kind of figured out almost instantaneously. So not soon after an earthquake, we can identify the location, right, the epicenter. So, you know, pretty soon people are like, hey, the epicenter is this, and it just occurred, you know, five minutes ago. As long as we have three of those, we can figure that out. So this is how we locate earthquakes. We need seismograms. We need the lag time, the difference in arrival between the P and the S. And we do need a chart that gives us a relationship between lag time and distance. We have all that. We can use those three to plot and where they intersect that is our epicenter.